There's, there's many reasons to expect that the United States shouldn't actually enjoy, or it should s start failing uh, in the sense that it's, it's so innovative. What, why, why do we continue to be so innovative? And the answer is because, uh, I think, and, and, well, the answer is this question. I was being interviewed by someone in Europe. Um, I, I, won't, I, won't pick a, I won't pick on any one country. I won't tell you what country it was, but the, the interviewer was asking me about Second Life, and he, and he said, you know, what was the experience like? And he, in particular, he said, uh, when you started Second Life, did you think that it would work? Did you think the idea of the company would work? And I said to him, well, in my heart, I felt, really felt that eventually uh, the idea was going to work, that, that there was going to be virtual worlds, and that those virtual worlds were going to be very high impact. They were going to be a big part of our society. But I didn't really know whether my ideas and my particular company, or even the point in time where I was starting it, would succeed or fail. And I remember watching, his eyes got a tiny bit wider when he was listening to me, and he, a little wider, and his next question was, what did your parents think? about that. When I started Second Life, I invested about a million dollars of my own money uh, in the company because I had been at this company, Real Networks, before that had gone public and so I made some money from that. And so I was able to risk my own capital in creating Second Life, the virtual world. I wasn't an, uh, I wasn't an entrepreneur. One of the things I, I love to say to people is entrepreneur is not a career. It's not a career choice. If you're if you're studying to be an entrepreneur, I, I'm not sure that's the right idea. That is to say, investors don't back companies because they have an entrepreneur as the founder. They, they back companies because the founder has quit their job or has only, you know, insanely worked on this one interesting idea for the last, you know, five years and is now trying to raise money to turn it into a company. Um, entre you, you absolutely, at least in my experience, startup companies don't work unless the founder, the, the, the entrepreneur, is just in some way irrationally obsessed. And so along the way, I had to grapple with a lot of questions about how would you manage, how would you build this software, how do you build a piece of software that, in the case of Second Life, was very uh, unpredictable and had a lot of pieces to it, had a lot of internet-connected uh, parts to it. In, in the end, Second Life has about 40,000 servers now, today, so it's, that's the number of servers that simulate the virtual world has all sorts of pieces and parts. And so from the very beginning, I kind of believed that I had to do something different on the management side because I didn't believe that I could really plan. I also wasn't a very good planner. I, I didn't think that I could really sit down and carefully plan out how you would build something with that scale of complexity. And so I sought other ways of doing that. And I sought ways, which I'll explain to you a little bit, uh, in, in, the, in product development and in, in essentially uh, decentralizing the process of building things. But I also did some really interesting management experience, experiments, which will probably just make you laugh, especially here in Lisbon. And I'd send this out to everybody. Can you imagine what the participation rate was on this? You know, like what percentage of people actually filled this out? All of them. And because the next day, the next day, and I didn't have a slide for this. I need to build one and put it. I just put this in for you guys because I thought this would be so thought-provoking. The next day, I would share the answers with everybody. So I would share the, the statistical result, essentially my confidence rating <laughs> as El Presidente uh, uh, of Second Life. And then uh, whether people thought I was getting better or worse. I, and, and the thing I used to say to everybody was I'd actually do a graph that showed them not only what the answers were from yesterday, but what the answers were from each quarter that I'd done the survey. And what I used to say to everybody was, it's not the absolute number that matters. Because my, my, I was well liked as a founder and CEO. I, but I used to say to them, it's not the absolute number that matters, it's the trend line. <laughs> and I used to say, because someday, you know you guys, someday, like every other founder, you're going to need to get rid of me. And I'm not going to want to leave. But you'll have the data. Uh, it was a fantastic curve. So, so as, as the CEO, I would then look at the output, you know, the results, what everybody got. And I'd always analyze, you know, who the top ten were. And, you know, they were the same top ten that a management-led bonus setting exercise, well, first of all, five of the people out of the top ten were the same people that if you use a traditional bonus process, bonus allocation process of the sort that you talk about in, in, in school, um, it, it'll generate those same five names. They were the same people that everybody would have said the names of anyway. They're, they're in there. They're in the top ten. But the other five people in the top ten are really interesting people that you should be rewarding and that you're not 
by a conventional process. The other thing that's so amazing about that is it removes management from the loop entirely. So it creates, it, it removes a huge source of tension between managers and their employees because now the managers are not involved in the process of actually finally setting your bonus and evaluating you. Lots of pros and cons to that, but again, very interesting uh, uh, idea. So those were two things that I did inside the company just as a management technique that I thought you might find interesting that uh, were very different um, and, and generated fascinating results. Gives you the idea. So um, I show you this because this is a, this is a very real complex uh, software project. It's not a piece of open source. It's not Linux or something like that, by the way. It has design challenge associated with it. It's a piece of software that has to be elegant. It has to work together. You know, it has to have all the traditional qualities that you think can tr normally only be done by one very smart person. You know, one great developer and one great designer working together in, you know, eating pizza in Silicon Valley. So again, here in Europe, this is perhaps even more horrifying to say, but I mean, if the reality is that we all work that way, why do we have jobs that on average we're at for 10 years? This happened over only a few quarters. Well, what I've seen in the data from our system is that most of us, myself included, on a new project, for example, do our best work over just a few months. So maybe there are ways to find ways to work together like this, or maybe there are other ways that are more conventional in nature that just accommodate that. The reality is people ought to move on to different jobs, stop doing what they're doing pretty, pretty early on. And I suspect that, you know, strong management doesn't improve. I, I, bet I, I bet I don't get any more work out of this guy even if he was working for me full time and I was, you know, very, you know, telling him what to do every day. What I think is more likely the case, and so take a product like Twitter or Second Life or Facebook or anything else, my suspicion is that what you'll find, I hope this graph makes itself clear, is that this is when you launch something, it has very low stability, it breaks all the time. And the, in the end, if, it's, if it continues to exist and you continue to make money, it has to be stable. You know what I mean? One way or another, it gets stable. My suspicion is that everything fails in a relatively similar ways a, f a fairly similar number of times. I, I don't know if it's seven, but I like the drama in that. Uh, people uh, pitching uh, uh, business ideas here. And it's really important to focus on, like, are, are you doing something that somebody else wants? I mean, it, it's very easy sometimes, to, and, and I think it's sedu seductive, to think about, like, starting a business in a category, uh, either because you just want to start your own business or you feel like there's a lot of opportunity in a segment, you know, like enterprise software or, or, or enterprise social network software. I heard a lot of stuff about that today, actually. That's, an, a, that's, that is a very interesting segment, but what you don't want to do is go raise money and start a company and hire people saying we're going we're gonna to be successful in the enterprise software social network segment. That is totally going to fail. What you have to say is, we're going to get people inside an enterprise to send around pictures of each other to their colleagues. And we have some idea why this is actually going to be good for the business.